All right. Well, thank you again for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate having you all here today, and we are really looking forward to today's talk. Just to go over a few housekeeping items first, uh, hopefully most of you are familiar with Zoom at this point, um, but we do recommend naming yourself within Zoom so that we can see who is joining us. Uh, you can do that by clicking on the participants panel, which would be the uh, little button with the people on it. And once you do that, you can find your name. And if you click more, you have the option to rename. You can, of course, include your name as well as your organization or your country where you're calling from as well. To keep the background noise today, we do ask that you please mute, mute your microphone or your phone if you're not speaking. Uh, that will keep things clear for our presenters. If you run into any issues with the internet connection, we do recommend closing other programs. So all you have open is the Zoom and hopefully that will help. Uh, if you have comments and questions, we certainly welcome those and we'll definitely have time for some Q&A toward the end of today's talk. I would recommend if you have questions as we go that you go ahead and enter those into the chat and I'll be able to monitor that and pass those questions along to our presenters. You do have the option as well to raise your hand if you need to do that, but it's again probably easier to go ahead and enter questions into the chat. We do have closed captioning available for today's presentation as well. You can see the CC button here. If you click that, you will see those captions come up in English. So today we are really excited to talk to you about cochlear implantation for single-sided deafness or unilateral hearing loss in children. We have two speakers from the University of North Carolina joining us today. And, you know, University of North Carolina has such a huge background and extensive background on research for unilateral hearing loss. And when Medell was able to obtain FDA approval over two years ago, which seems crazy to me now that uh, we've had that for long enough now, um, but we were able to get that, that approval in large part because UNC was so kind to share their data with us. So we were able to take a large body of evidence on single-sided deafness and asymmetric hearing loss in adults and share that with FDA and uh, change the indication for use for our cochlear implants. But today we are focusing specifically on pediatrics and uh, now we're talking about long-term results. We've got two-year data here that we're really excited to share with you today. Um, it's such a great body of evidence for us to be able to look a little bit more in depth at the pediatric population specifically and learn a little bit about how they're doing with unilateral you know, hearing loss and a cochlear implant. So before we jump into the presentations today, I do have a couple questions. So we are going to try some Mentimeter polling. In order to access that, you can use the link on the left side here at menti.com and enter the code you see, or you can scan the QR code using your, your mobile phone. So we'll give everybody just a minute to do that. Um, should come right up if you use the QR code, or again, you can access that through the menti.com link and enter the code 98405719. Get everybody entered into that. All right, so our first question here, just to get everybody rolling with this, is asking exactly where you're joining us from this morning. Looks like we have a bunch of different answers here. So we have some, uh, join, uh, some uh, participants from the US as well as all around the world. I see Germany, Switzerland, Iceland. This is great, Canada, all over. Egypt, awesome. All right. Great. Well, we have a wide range of visitors today, so that's definitely exciting. Okay, I think we can go on to the next question now. All right, so more specific to today's topic, uh, I'd like to know what ages have you evaluated to receive a cochlear implant for unilateral hearing loss? Are you seeing primarily adult patients at this point, pediatric patients? How young are those pediatric patients? In the United States, we're approved for implantation for patients ages five and older. Um, but of course, uh, there are people who are choosing to implant in children younger than that. Um, so just curious to see, looks like we have a pretty wide range here. All right, definitely a lot of people that are evaluating adult patients, but we're seeing a pretty good range of pediatric patients as well. And some that are, uh, 
talking about CI for children even under 12 months of age. So that's really interesting to see. That's a good information for us to have. All right, great. Okay. Oops, sorry. So we will uh, go ahead and jump into our presentations here. Uh, unfortunately, Kevin Brown was unable to join us today due to some prior commitments, but we do have his talk recorded here. So you'll still be able to hear all the great information that he has to share. And then we have Lisa Park who is available to share her presentation and then we'll answer questions at the end as well. Uh, but Dr. Brown has, again, a lot of experience with single-sided deafness and asymmetric hearing loss for adults and children. And we welcome his expertise today. So we will go ahead ahead and jump into his presentation. Good morning from us here in the United States and good afternoon to all of you in Europe. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Kevin Brown from the University of North Carolina. I am joined today by Dr. Lisa Park, and we are delighted to be speaking with you today about uh, the uh, treatments that we have um, for unilateral sensory hearing loss, specifically the two-year results of our Childhood Unilateral Hearing Loss uh, Clinical Trial. And I think um, that um, everyone would agree that the results of this trial definitely demonstrate to us that we are finally on target for the treatment of these children that have unilateral sensory hearing loss. These are my disclosures. And this is our cochlear implant team, both adult and pediatric. And really it's through the combined efforts of this really broad and diverse team that we're able to accomplish a lot of the things that we're able to do as a group. And I would just like to recognize all of them, um, specifically Dr. Dillon, as well as uh, Dr. Park, who will be talking to you uh, later today. Um, just to begin, a little bit of terminology. Um, a lot of people will refer to uh, children that have unilateral sensory hearing loss as having single-sided single deafness. Um, and really, we're describing um, a very similar thing where there's normal to near normal hearing in the unaffected ear. Um, and uh, the patient is basically reaching uh, single ear implant candidacy in the affected ear. Um, I tend to favor unilateral hearing loss, unilateral sensory hearing loss as a descriptor because single-sided deafness really implies a complete inability to hear in the affected ear um, and uh, implies that there's at least severe to profound hearing loss. And it does not really take into account a patient's speech perception and does not account for sloping hearing loss, which is something that we're seeing increasingly in both children and adults that have unilateral hearing loss that will benefit from cochlear implantation. Unilateral hearing loss conversely describes hearing loss in one ear without really qualifying the severity and it allows us as clinicians to determine uh, the candidacy of the uh, uh, cochlear implant patient. So uh, I think it's really important for us to discuss about what causes unilateral hearing loss. There's many causes seen in adults. It's commonly idiopathic, which we presume to be viral. It can be from chronic otitis media or cholesteoma. Uh, cholesteatoma or uh, cerebellopontine angle tumors. Um, it's really uncommon in adults to be previously undiagnosed um, congenital hearing losses or congenital malformations. But in children, there's a very high percentage of malformation or cochlear nerve deficiency. Um, down here, we show um, a study comparing the uh, different um, etiologies um, that was done by Shinichi Usami, who demonstrated that in adults, the majority of these are occurring from idiopathic sensory hearing loss, but in children, really a majority of them were occurring because of cochlear nerve deficiency. Uh, we looked at this ourselves in a paper that is now accepted by audiology and neurotology, um, where uh, we look specifically at both our cohorts of patients that had unilateral hearing loss and those that had asymmetric hearing loss, where there was a degree of mild or worse hearing loss in the contralateral ear. And what we found also was that there was a very high percentage of these children that had cochlear nerve deficiency and uh, uh, also a high proportion of them that had uh, previously undiagnosed inner ear malformations. Um, a similar, um, albeit slightly lower percentage was seen in those kids that had asymmetric hearing loss as well. 
So why is losing hearing from one ear a problem? Um, and you know, if you have one good ear, why, why does it matter? Um, well, the brain relies on binaural cues to best determine the location of sound as well as to provide an optimal signal to noise ratio to decipher speech in the background of noise. And patients can't always control their orientation to noise in their environment. And I think this is particularly important with children because children, unlike adults, are potentially sitting in a classroom setting where they're really restricted in their ability to move around. Um, the binaural cues that we utilize in order to better understand speech in a background of noise and or determine the direction of sound include timing cues, amplitude cues, and spectral cues. And I think it's really important for us to also realize that um, losing hearing from one ear is kind of an invisible disability because if we're communicating in a, convert, in a quiet environment, it doesn't really show up as being a problem. And these kids will still develop speech um, and language at reasonable rates, but they just tend to have more difficulty in the school system, again, where there's going to be much more noise. The consequences that we see of single-sided uh, deafness or unilateral hearing loss is there is a decrease in sound localization, there's decreased speech understanding and noise, there's a decreased quality of hearing. Um, adults much more so than children can experience tinnitus, and when um, a child or an adult for that matter is forced to try and listen through one ear and decipher what is being said, um, this is a significant increase in the amount of cognitive or auditory effort that's being expended in order to understand what's being said. And that can accumulate over the course of the day, leading towards fatigue. Um, unique to children is that their lexicon is not really mature. They're still learning language. Um, they require a more favorable signal to noise ratio to access spoken language. Education happens in a noisy environment and that process of education is not just teacher to child, where you can sometimes control the orientation of the teacher towards the child by putting them towards the front of the classroom, but they're really also learning through their peers. So when their peers are responding to questions or otherwise communicating in the classroom, they have to be able to hear that as well. Um, children, as I mentioned, may be unable to adjust their position relative to noise in the educational environment because they're uh, required to sit at a specific seat. Um, children are also developing a sense of self-worth and esteem, and if they are doing so in a circumstance in which they are struggling in the classroom, potentially being, potentially being told they're not paying attention, um, etc., you can see how that might erode their uh, sense of self-worth and confidence. And as I mentioned, the accumulation of auditory or cognitive effort can lead to fatigue and problematic in adults, but really devastating for children who, if um, towards the end of the day, they are really struggling with fatigue, it may affect their ability to learn. Um, not surprisingly, when people have looked um, at what occurs in children that have unilateral hearing loss, their localization and hearing and noise is affected. They tend to have poor language scores, and those poor language scores can persist into adolescence. They have higher rates of behavioral issues, and they may have lower rates of self-esteem, and they can have increased listening-related fatigue. The options that exist for treatment are a contralateral routing of signal aid, um, which basically picks up sound on the side that a patient cannot hear with what looks like a hearing aid and then transmits that to a also similar hearing aid-like device that they wear on the contralateral ear. There's also bone anchored hearing implants, um, which function by transmitting the vibration of sound from the side that a child cannot hear to the side that they can. It's important in both of these circumstances to understand that this does not permit a child to take benefit of binaural cues. Um, a cochlear implant, however, because it restores hearing to the affected ear, does provide the ability to take advantage of those binaural cues. There are three major physical or cognitive effects with respect to binaural hearing that can be taken advantage of to promote better hearing and noise when binaural hearing is present. These include head shadow, um, squelch, and binaural summation. The differences in the timing and amplitude of sound to ears permits this localization to occur, which I'll talk about here in a moment. So with respect to speech and noise, uh, head shadow, speech and noise are separated um, spatially. In this uh, diagram, we see that uh, sound is being presented towards the front. And then we have a, uh, a noise source here on this individual's left ear. And this creates a circumstance where um, if they had a cochlear implant in this right ear, that ear would now have a better signal to noise ratio than the contralateral side would. And it would permit them to hear better in that noisy um, that noise arrangement. When we look at speech and noise, um, uh, there's also this effect of squelch where 
the uh, noise is uh, separated such that you get um, a sound source in one ear and a noise source in the other ear. And cognitively, your brain is able to process this, process this in a way that enables it to better distinguish what is being said against that background of noise, almost as if it's filtering the noise away. Um, that does require cognitive processing for that to occur, whereas with head shadow, that is a circumstance in which um, it's just a physical effect. Summation um, is the benefit of signal presentation to both ears. Um, and the best way to think about this is that if you put a headphone in one ear and then put a headphone in the second ear, when you put the headphone in the second ear, it's louder. Um, it's not. Um, they're at the same volume, but it per is perceived by your brain as being louder because now both auditory pathways are being stimulated at the same time. And your brain also takes advantage of this when um, it is um, uh, processing sound information. Localization is a little different where sound hits ears at different times and at different intensities. And that difference can then be used by the brain to accurately compute the direction that sound originates. In the circumstance, we see that the sound source is off to the patient's left, and that sound source is going to hit the left ear a little bit sooner than it hits the right ear, and it's going to be a little bit louder in that left ear than it would the right ear. And when that occurs, your brain can actually utilize the differences in both timing and amplitude to determine the direction that sound is coming from. Tinnitus is really an issue predominantly in adults. It tends to be relatively uncommon in children, and it occurs because there's a lack of electrical input from the affected ear, which creates this vacuum of information. It's been likened to a phantom limb syndrome in which the sensation occurs, sensation of sound is occurring in the absence, or the, in which a sensation occurs in the absence of the functional organ. Um, and there's really not a good treatment option for these patients. As far as the quality of hearing, the inability to orient um, to sound in an environment is something that um, patients, parents, children all complain about. Um, they really have frustration with understanding speech with any noise in the environment. Um, overall, the volume of sound seem to be reduced. Um, sometimes there can be a loss of a socialization, and for adults, there can be concerns about work. Auditory effort is defined as this cognitive effort that's required to perceive what is being said. This effort increases with age, bilateral hearing loss, unilateral hearing loss, if the language is unfamiliar or if it has an accent or a dialect, or if somebody is trying to understand language in an environment of competing noise. This can lead to increased fatigue, speech confusion, as well as decreased short-term memory retention. And if you think about, again, this occurring, in a child who is um, trying to learn um, their lexicon and basically develop you know, these language skills, um, this can really be problematic for them. Typical workup for uh, children that has hearing loss is gonna be a careful history and physical exam. Um, I tend to especially focus for those that have an acquired uh, hearing loss um, for um, any history of inflammatory or infectious disease. Um, and the reason being is that um, in that setting in which they have had, you know, sort of a chronic otitis media or maybe even a severe acute otitis media, um, you can sometimes run into circumstances where you get surprised when you go to open up the cochlea and you find that there's either some fibrosis or even ossification in the beginning part of the basal turn. And you want to be prepared for that. Um, audiogram is obviously going to be obtained, um, potentially specialized testing um, as far as speech perception and noise. Um, and imaging wise, um, due to the asymmetry, I always obtain an MRI scan really to look at the fluid signal in the cochlea to show whether the lumen of the cochlea is still patent and then CT becomes an option. As far as the options for unilateral hearing loss, um, some parents may choose or the child, if they are older, may choose really not to have any treatment done. And that is certainly an option. And we've seen children that have a complete hearing loss on one side um, still be able to perform at very high levels in the school. Um, cross by cross is an option. We generally don't advocate doing that in younger children because they really don't have the the facility to potentially reach up and take that device off if it is starting to compromise their ability to hear in the classroom. Um, bone conduction devices, similar, um, not something that we're really placing on younger children, potentially older children. And then cochlear implants, of course, is the option we're talking about today. So when you think about um, cochlear implants and kind of how we have gotten to this point, um, it's really amazing that, you know, back during the time when I was uh, doing fellowship, that we really thought that a uh, cochlear implant and acoustic hearing would not work together. And I remember having the discussion that it would be like somebody speaking 
German in one ear and Japanese in the other one. There would be no way that your brain could reconcile those two very different sounds or languages in a way that would help you understand it. But of course, the brain is smarter than we are, and it is able to do that. Um, to help facilitate that, we really need the implant to align as close as possible to what the other ear is hearing. And we do feel that the best place pitch matching um, that we can create enables that to occur. And of course, the cochlear implant cannot detract from hearing in the acoustic ear. So this is something that has been studied at length in adults. Um, this was a study done by Jill First at WashU. Had 47 subjects, um, had a poor hearing ear that met clinical CI candidacy criteria uh, with less than 50% on open sentence sentences and a better hearing ear. And they underwent cochlear implantation on the worst hearing ear. All three manufacturers were utilized um, and they evaluated speech perception and localization at six and 12 months. Um, what she found is that with respect to CNC word scores, um, with the cochlear implant that they did achieve respectable uh, word scores, which are relatively comparable to what we get with our standard cochlear implant recipients at around 50%. <clears throat> when she looked at speech understanding and noise, um, uh, what she found is that there was um, when noise was presented to the poor hearing ear, um, that there was an improvement with the addition of the cochlear implant. And when noise was being presented to uh, the better hearing ear, there was also an improvement, um, indicating that there was a very mild squelch effect and a more prominent head shadow effect. When um, patients were evaluated um, for their ability to localize, you can see here that when they had the advantage of both the uh, cochlear implant and uh, the better uh, ear working together that they were able to localize significantly better than they were without. And when uh, SSQ was applied, um, you see that there were significant benefits specifically in that spatial hearing domain, which we had talked about is really something that patients struggle with. We also performed a clinical trial here at UNC that was sponsored by um, Medell, where we looked at 20 adults with moderate to profound sensory hearing loss in the affected ear. Um, and normal to near normal hearing in the contralateral ear. And this utilized the standard electrode, which we feel provides the best place pitch matching. And what we found in a series of reports that we generated in 2017 and 2018 is that word scores rapidly improved, plateauing somewhere around six months and then kind of tapering off up through about 12 months. And again, reaching that, you know, 50 to 60% uh, word score range. As far as speech perception in noise, we see a really, you know, uh, significant improvement in speech perception in noise with a head shadow effect, uh, a slight improvement with uh, frontal summation, and then uh, no significant change in squelch. When we looked at localization, localization improved rapidly and radically um, from the pre-op condition to one month, and then continued to improve slightly up through that 12-month period. And we've actually looked at this out now through five years, and we still continue to see uh, some improvement. And on the SSQ, we see both total speech and definitely spatial, um, that there is improvement um, in the patient's qualitative experience of how their hearing has improved with a cochlear implant. So in summary, these data together demonstrate conclusively that cochlear implantation in adult unilateral hearing loss subjects leads to a significant improvement on speech recognition in the affected ear with the implant alone and spatial hearing tasks with the cochlear implant plus the normal hearing ear in subjective report um, and in tinnitus reduction, which I didn't show, but they did. Um, so the uh, question then becomes, well, what about children? And this is where Dr. Park will take over and talk about the results of our clinical trial. Uh, thank you. All right. I think it's really great to have that background information on exactly how we got to this point. You know, I think for so many of us, we're used to thinking about patients with bilateral hearing loss, and there's some special considerations for patients that are really only dealing with that hearing loss in one ear. I think it's important to talk about what the consequences of that unilateral hearing loss are. This is something that's important. And we are seeing these patients coming to the clinic looking for a solution. So obviously, they're struggling, and we want to be able to provide the best options to help. So really helpful information from Dr. Brown there. Before we jump into Dr. Lisa Park's presentation today, we do have another Mentimeter polling question. So you can, again, either go to the link and enter the code here or scan the QR code. Or if you still have your web browser pulled up from the earlier questions, you should be able to still access it through that. 
either way there, you can log back into that. And here we want to know what types of tests you're typically using to evaluate your outcomes for CI recipients with unilateral hearing loss. So we have a couple early answers here of looking at open set speech or spatially separated speech and noise. Um, are we also seeing speech testing in quiet, monosyllabic words, mostly sentences, how many people are doing localization testing, uh, just kind of getting an idea of what you think are the most useful things to be able to demonstrate to your patients that they are in fact experiencing an improvement with a CI or even with other alternative treatments. Um, definitely getting a lot of different options here. Looks like mostly a focus on speech and noise using maybe AZ bio sentences, matrix sentence test, matrix test and noise. Have a, a little bit of uh, CNC words in here and some peer tones as well. So that's good. I think kind of looking at really the whole battery of tests that we have available and how all of those work together to give us useful information for our patients. All right. Great, definitely getting some good answers rolling in here. Okay, great, thank you. So here we will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Lisa Park. She has so much experience with these children evaluating uh, preoperatively and looking at outcomes. And we're really grateful she is here to share those experiences with us. Thank you, Allison. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so I'm very happy to be here to follow up with Dr. Brown's presentation to share with you the outcomes from our clinical trial. Um, we call it the ch uh, cochlear implantation in children with unilateral hearing loss, so we've dubbed it the COOL trial. And the aims of our study, we wanted to look at the benefits of cochlear implantation in children who are like preschool, kindergarten age, um, who had unilateral hearing loss. And we had the opportunity to compare their outcomes to a group of peers with normal hearing. We began enrolling in 2017 under an IDE with the FDA and in a device exemption. Um, Dr. Brown was the PI, and this is a prospective clinical trial where we followed typically developing children um, who were quite young, between three and a half to six and a half at the age of, of implantation. They were all CI candidates in the ear to be implanted. Uh, English was their primary language. None of them had cochlear nerve deficiency, no aplasia, no hypoplasia, um, no major inner ear malformations, and no signs of ossification. All of the children received a Medel synchrony device and two sonnet speech processors. We only used ear level processors in this study in an attempt to avoid any possible mic placement effects. And here are the details on our participants, their ages at implantation, etiologies, suspected length of profound loss at the time of device activation. And here's why I say suspected. Only seven of these children were identified via newborn hearing screening. One wasn't tested at all. They were born out of the country and the rest either passed or initially uh, passed and then uh, initially failed and then passed on a rescreen. So of those children, three had a sudden loss related to a specific event. And we had those three sudden cases and a couple of kids who were identified and had a progressive hearing loss. But for nine of these cases, we have no idea when they lost their hearing. So these numbers are based on parental estimates. And unfortunately, that's fairly common here in the US um, in terms of unilateral hearing loss. Something happens between birth and their kindergarten screening and that's when they find out that they have unilateral hearing loss. Um, the two older children who were noted with asterisks were a little bit older. Um, and they were implanted under compassionate use. They were not included in the analysis that I'm gonna show you here. So our mean suspected duration of deafness was three and a half years and the mean age at implantation was five years. This is our test battery. It's also lines up with my agenda. It included measures of single word recognition, hearing and spatially separated noise, localization, and several questionnaires meant to look at device acceptance and quality of life. We'll go into each of them in more detail. We also had a group of 18 same-aged peers with normal hearing who complete, completed all of the test battery except for those subjective questionnaires. 
Let's talk about those word recognition outcomes, something co cochlear implant audiologists really like to hear about. Uh, first, I like to talk about what kids with SSD who do not have any assistive technology are doing in their everyday listening situations. Um, on this graph, you'll see the percent correct CNC word scores that were obtained in the sound field. So in blue are the results for the SSD group with their CI off, so their normal hearing ear alone. And in red are the scores for the normal hearing group listening with both of their ears. Age is spread across the X axis. Uh, participants were tested at the 24 month test point for the CI group. And we found that children with normal hearing in both ears actually have better word recognition in the sound field at typical conversational levels than children with SSD who aren't using any technology. Older children had higher scores in the normal hearing group but age wasn't a factor for the SSD group. So it looks like when we put children in the most controlled, quiet, conversational listening environment, children with SSD are already at a listening disadvantage. We also looked at the changes in CNC word scores over time with the deafened ear alone. So this is a similar graph to the previous figure, but here we plotted increasing post-activation intervals with darker colors. So first we see what we already know. Traditional amplification doesn't help. Those are those light dots at the very bottom that are zero scores. Those are measured with a hearing aid preoperatively. But a CI does improve scores in the affected ear over time. These scores were obtained with a direct connection to the cochlear implant. And CI scores are better than those preoperative hearing aid scores by the three month point, so very early on. And they seem to stabilize around six to nine months or so. So in the early months of use, older children perform better than the younger children, likely due, their, due to their ability to do the task, but this evened out over time. So that's great information, but we don't want to stop there because these families aren't coming to us to hear single words better in one ear. They came to us for spatial hearing, listening fatigue. Those are the things that we hear most commonly from families. So this population is different than your typical CI patient. So we need to create specialized test protocols for these children in the clinic. Single words in their deaf ear and isolation cannot be our primary metric. That's not what we're trying to make happen here. We're trying to encourage binaural hearing. So you have to keep going with your testing so you can look at the development of binaural hearing abilities. Maybe showing my age there with the energizer button. So what we see in these cases is a real difficulty with spatial hearing and masked sen sentence recognition is a task that can be adapted for most clinical setups to get a measure of spatial hearing ability. And this is how we set that up. We're testing children with the BKB SIN with speech and babble co-located in front. So you can see that there, those navy blue squares are our speaker setup. The child's facing front and both speech and noise are coming from the front. We can move the speech this uh, noise signal to the CI ear and we can turn the child and change our signal again so that speech is in the front and noise is to the better hearing ear. And since we want to be able to account for any developmental effects, again we test with both device on and device off at each test interval. And we do this in the regular clinic booth and our clinical team does this as well. Typically they're only testing device on to look for equivalent amounts of spatial release from masking when noise is directed to either ear, um, but they do go ahead and do that unaided testing when they think that it's needed. So we're going to go ahead and illustrate our outcomes here in terms of the better hearing ear and the poorer hearing ear. And these examples, the little guy at the top is gonna to illustrate where the speech and noise are coming from. And down at the bottom, the uh, figure there will show you how we tested this cohort in the booth, where the speech and noise were coming from for this particular measure. And in this example, the left ear is the deafened ear. The plot here is going to show you BKB SIN scores grouped together for the normal hearing group, the SSD group with their normal hearing ear alone, and the SSD group with their CI and normal hearing ear together. The masker is going to come from either the front, the CI side or the left side in the case of the normal hearing group, and the normal hearing side or the right side in the case of the normal hearing group. So when speech and masker are presented in front of the child, we expect there to be a certain signal to noise ratio required to understand about half of what was said. And on the BKB SIN, that threshold is called this SNR50 and a lower number is better. 
In kids with bilateral normal hearing, this is going to be the most difficult condition with speech and mask are co-located in front. Once the mask and speech are separated, the speech stays in front, the mask is presented at the poorer ear, and the target to mask ratio is improved at the ear contralateral to the mask. That would mean that children can tolerate an overall lower SNR for speech recognition and that SNR 50 improves. This is that spatial release from masking that we wanna see. For kids with SSD, this works relatively well when the mask is at the poor ear, although it still isn't working quite as well as it does for kids with bilateral normal hearing. When the masker is at the better ear, the better target to masker ratio is at the poorer ear and children with SSD aren't able to access it and they do not have spatial release from masking in that condition as their peers with normal hearing do. When we compared the SSD group listening with their normal hearing ear alone to the normal hearing group, we saw no significant difference between the groups in the speech front noise front condition, which was interesting. When noise was to the left for the normal hearing group or the poorer side for the ACI group, the normal hearing group performed significantly better. And the same for when the masker was at the better ear or right in the case of the normal hearing group. So both of those spatially separated conditions, the normal hearing group outperformed the SSD group. So let's give our friend here a CI, quick little surgery there. Um, the use of the CI improved scores for the SSD group in all three conditions. So this suggests that they may be benefiting from head shadow, binaural summation, and squelch. It's important to note though, that they still perform significantly poorer than their normal hearing peers in both spatially separated conditions. I think it's really important to note that for realistic expectations. So while the use of the CI did make a significant improvement for the SSD group, they are still not performing as well as those with normal hearing in both ears. So we're getting better. Um, but they still do have a hearing loss that is impacting their, their hearing and noise. Let's talk localization. This is our, what our setup looks like. We have an array of speakers that the child sits in, and each of the speakers are 18 degrees apart. And the children sit in the center. They hear a speech shaped noise at 70 dB SPL, and they turn their head toward the speaker to let us know where they think the sound is coming from. They wear a cool little headlamp. We turn the lights off. We have animals over the speakers and they actually look forward to this. They have a good time. We go on a little safari and try to catch the animals. So first is our comparison to normal hearing peers. You see the overall root mean square error is the difference between the sound source azimuth and the response azimuth. So a lower score indicates a more accurate localization of the sound source. Essentially, it's telling you how far off are they in terms of knowing where the sound is coming from. Age is on the X axis. And here we see RMS error in degrees with, for kids with normal hearing in orange at the bottom with very little error. Kids with UHL wearing their CI are in blue, so really pretty good scores there. And the SSD group with their CI off is in red. So kids with normal hearing have the best scores, followed by kids with SSD using a CI, and finally the kids with SSD when they have their CI off. The normal hearing group did not exhibit a change in scores with age, but the SSD group did have a significant decrease in scores with increasing age with the normal hearing ear alone. And we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, notably, six participants were performing within the fourth quartile of the normal hearing group after 24 months of use. So that was pretty exciting to see. So for kids who use a C CI in the cases of SSD, localization improves pretty dramatically early on. We tested device on, and device off at each test point. We saw scores improve with the use of a CI as early as the three month test point. Age was a factor at those later intervals with older children showing less error. And we think that this may be because older children would be better able to transfer the localization cues that they may be learning as they gain experience with binaural listening to the unilateral condition. It's just a theory. So I really, really like to show this graph um, that shows improvement in performance over time. So what we see here in this graph is where the sound is coming from. So all the way to the left or all the way to the right and where the child thought it come from, came from, where their response was. So here all the way to the left and all the way to the right again. So when they are right on target, we see their scores right there. There's the line of agreement in the middle. So what we see in this case 
in this child, when she had her CI off at the three month interval, she thought everything was at the left to her better hearing ear. When she had it on, she was starting to get some lateralization. She could tell if it was on the left or the right, um, but if it was in the middle, it was still more difficult for her. We see just six months later at nine months, she's improving both on and off, but particularly with the CI on. By 18 months, we're getting even better. And at 24 months, she's pr pretty spot on. So I really like to show that graph. It's really fun to see that improve over time. So moving on to our subjective data. First, I wanna share, share with you the information we got on the pediatric quality of life fatigue scale. So this is a scale that the parents fill out on how tired they think their child is in three different domains, um, cognitive fatigue, general fatigue, and sleep fatigue. And we had a lot of factors that came into play here. First of all, a lot of the parents said that they didn't realize how tired their children were until after they got a CI. So some of those um, fatigue scores from the early months may be a little elevated. Um, also, a lot of these kids started school during the course of the study. They started kindergarten, so that's pretty exhausting for any kid. And we were still collecting data during the early days of the pandemic, which was very exhausting for all of us. So I think what's really important to take away from this and that was very consistent was that parents felt that their children were most significantly, significantly impacted by cognitive fatigue followed by general fatigue and sleep fatigue. And these scores that we see here are comparable to children with hearing loss that we see in the literature. Pediatric SSQ, so this is the speech, spatial, and qualities questionnaire for children. We did still have the parents fill it out as proxy as some of our kids were quite young. Um, we saw in the pre-op to the early intervals, quite a dramatic change that you can see there. So from pre-operatively to as early as three months post-activation, we saw increases in speech, spatial, and qualities scales. Um, there was a trend for increasing scores over time, but it didn't reach significance when, in just those post-operative intervals. So parents indicated that their children were most significantly impacted by spatial hearing, followed by speech, understanding, and, also, and then finally, qualities of sound. The burn benefit questionnaire, again, we had parents uh, use report on this as proxy for their children. In this scale, uh, it goes from zero to, my lazy corner again, from zero to plus five or negative five. So anything that's in the positive realm, they felt, parents felt their children were performing better with the device. And in the negative realm, parents felt they were doing better without the device. And there's a series of questions that they answer there. So early on, parents didn't feel that the device that their child was using helped them in any way, but as early as three months past, uh, three months post-activation, they were feeling that their child did better with the CI on. And one of the questions that we had was whether or not some of the tests that are easier to perform, perform in a typical clinical setting are predictive of spatial hearing measures in any way. So as clinicians, we often use those CI alone scores as a marker of progress and success with the cochlear implant. We did not find any significant correlation between CNC word scores in the, norm, in the CI ear alone and BKB SIN scores, localization, spatial release from masking, or any of the subjective report measures. So these results suggest that isolated CNC word scores do not predict spatial hearing abilities or subjective benefits in children with SSD using cochlear implants. So while they're nice to have to monitor progress, and look for any signs of potential device issues, they shouldn't be relied on as the sole measure of success for kids with unilateral hearing loss who receive cochlear implants. Unfortunately, we also didn't find any correlation between the questionnaires and any of the spatial hearing measures either. But we do think questionnaires are an important part of an evaluation. They give clinicians a sense of how the family or the child perceives their CI benefit, but they aren't a substitute for actual spatial hearing measures. So unfortunately from this study, we weren't able to look at the effects of duration of deafness and such a large portion of our, of our population, we didn't know how long they had been deaf. We couldn't look at the effects of agent implant because we had such a narrow window there and whether or not an implant improves those educational concerns that Dr. Brown talked about earlier. 
But what we do know is that cochlear implantation in cases of pediatric unilateral hearing loss is safe. It improves word recognition in that implanted ear. It improves, they show evidence of binaural summation, squelch, and they are able to use head shadow effect. They improve their localization and subjectively improves their hearing and their fatigue. Thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions and I'm happy to answer any questions you have for me today. That's really fantastic. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, I think, you know, we have learned so much about unilateral hearing loss in a variety of populations over the past several years. And I think uh, being able to have such a, a nice pool of subjects in the pediatric uh, group here is fantastic. And seeing these outcomes is really exciting. You know, we're really seeing that some of those are, are mimicking the adult outcomes, which is exciting and, and even, you know, picking up on their own things as well. Uh, I believe when we first started this trial, you know, we had some discussions about whether the children would even really be able to do some of these tests. And so I love how you've been able to find ways to make it exciting for them so that they come into the clinic and actually, you know, enjoy doing their safari and finding the animals and everything. That's fantastic. Before we get into the Q&A, we are going to do one of our experts online traditions and take a group photo with everybody here. So if you wouldn't mind turning on your cameras at this point, we can get a shot of everybody that has joined us this morning. We really appreciate you being here and appreciate your participation. So uh, get some cameras on there and we can do a screenshot. We do three, two, one. All right. All right. Hopefully we got that done. We have had a few questions come in here. We did have a question come in about the age for implantation for congenital SSD. So I realized in this trial that there was a pretty narrow age range, as you said, for inclusion in the study. But in your experience, do you have an age where you think would be a cutoff for congenital SSD based on duration of deafness? Or um, what do you think about that? We have not made a cutoff here at UNC. Um, we do counsel patients fairly um, strongly when they've had a very long duration of deafness that they might not see the same results as someone who had a shorter duration of deafness. And we leave it up to the family um, and the child as to whether or not they wanna go ahead and pursue that implant. Um, we think younger is better for, ev for everything, of course. Um, so we do encourage implantation as young as is possible. Um, but that being said, you know, when somebody comes in and they're, you know, 14 years old and they're congenitally deaf, if they want to give it a try um, and they have a nerve, we are willing to give it a try with them. Um, there are some reports in the literature that show some pretty significant benefits from some of those people who have longer durations of deafness. So we don't want to count anybody out just yet. That's great. So not really having a hard cutoff, but just kind of taking all circumstances into consideration, considering motivation and expectations and everything. I think that that makes a lot of sense to me for where we are right now. Uh, what age do you typically see imaging being completed for these candidates? Are they typically coming to the clinic with the older imaging? Are you getting that repeated? Um, are there any imaging considerations then specifically to rule out CND as well? Yeah, so we, Dr. Brown did deputize me to answer medical questions. And if there's <laughs> anything that um, I can't answer, I'll go ahead and get your information and pass that along to him. Um, but we do get those MRIs fairly early. It's just our routine here um, in, when there is a new uh, diagnosis. Um, sometimes they'll try to get an MRI when they're getting that uh, repeat ABR so they don't have to sedate a child again. Um, so I think six months is the earliest that I've seen them going ahead and getting those um, MRIs if they can't get it with an ABR, with a sedated ABR. Um, if imaging has been done elsewhere and it's good and it's an MRI, uh, we don't typically repeat that unless we're not happy with the images. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something we do. We do want to have um, MRIs. We don't want to rely on CTs to make sure that there is no evidence of cochlear nerve deficiency. And that means hypoplasia as well. Um, just a little bit of a nerve is still not something that we're willing to implant. That makes sense. That's great. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting finding from Dr. Brown's presentation, how many of the children coming in with unilateral hearing loss have some form of cochlear nerve dysplasia as a, as a um, etiology. 
switching gears a little bit, we have a question about therapy post activation. So what types of auditory education or rehabilitation are you recommending or seeing these children have moving forward? That's a great question. So in the study, we did uh, require therapy for the first six months of the study, they received therapy twice a month. Um, and then for the second six months, um, they received therapy once a month. And then for the second year of the study, we um, did not require therapy. They could do it on their own if they wanted to. Honestly, we found that most kids did not. Uh, clinically, what we are doing is we are recommending therapy and hoping people follow through on it. Some families are doing things on their own, um, but we do think that it's helpful in terms of kind of waking that ear up and making it um, tune in to hearing again. Um, we are feeling more and more like we need to encourage some binaural hearing after we wake that ear up and we've done an auditory hierarchy with that cochlear implant alone, um, that we need to do some things that are working on localization and hearing and spatially separated noise to encourage those binaural skills. That's great. We had another question about wind noise reduction and why that was switched off and if that was done only during testing or uh, also done for the program the child was using at home. It wasn't available when we first started the study and so we wanted to just keep it stable throughout the rest of the, the, of the study. Routinely now I just keep it on. That makes sense, great. Um, another question about the earliest age of a child that you've seen get implanted with CI, and maybe if you can speak a little to any special testing considerations, if there are any children you've seen that are younger than what was included in the study as well. Yeah, we have implanted a couple of kids under the age of 12 months, specifically children who had meningitis. We want to make sure that we get an implant in there as early as we possibly can. Um, it is, of course, very challenging to test those kids. We're relying on objective measures quite a bit, ESRT and things to program them. Um, we do try to use a plug and muff technique with those kids. We have some very tiny ear bands that we can use for testing in the sound field as much as we possibly can. And we try to do some masking and, current and just turn it on, give them some time to adapt to that. Um, and then we can try some tones and see if they can hear some with those. But yes, it is very challenging to test those little ones. Um, we do the best that we can, but, you know, early, we, we're, we're big proponents of earlier being better. So we want to make sure that we're giving them access to sound as early as we can. Great. That makes sense. Um, do you have any cases where children did not see improvements with the cochlear implant? And were you able to kind of figure out what maybe was going on there? And do you have any recommendations in the instance where they're not seeing those improvements on what you might um, suggest they try moving forward? Most of the time when we're not seeing improvement, we're also not seeing um, a lot of use of the implant. Um, so we encourage full-time use is the number one thing. Um, other cases, we've seen some transfer patients that we've looked at their imaging after the fact and seen that there may be some cochlear nerve deficiency there that they really did go ahead and get an implant. Um, and they weren't able to benefit from it because they had a hypo hypoplastic nerve. Um, so those are the biggest cases um, where we don't see benefit is if they're not wearing it or mm -hmm. they don't have a good nerve. Okay, and do you have any tips and tricks maybe for those who are, are working with some children who maybe aren't enthusiastic about wearing it? Is, is there anything you found that really helps to encourage usage or, or just give it time? Just give it time. And that's something we find a lot in our teenage patients that it's really mm -hmm. difficult. Um, so when we do you know, talk to families and when the family comes in and the child, obviously the teenager does not want it and doesn't want to wear it. We have an honest talk about that, that if they're not going to wear it, they're not going to benefit from it. And why go through surgery um, if they're not going to go ahead and wear their device? A couple of the kids that we work with, their parents have implemented a, okay, when you wear your, when you do your therapy and wear your implant, that's when you get your screen time. So they're streaming to their implant and that's their screen time. So that's helped for some of the kids. Um, but we found during the pandemic also, we've seen a little bit of a lowered use of implants in our SSD population because they're in very quiet environments. Um, or they're learning on their computer and they're not using their implant um, when they're doing that. Uh, so we have seen the pandemic affect use a little bit as well. That makes sense. I like that suggestion of getting screen time while they're streaming to the cochlear implant. If you have a, a kid who's particularly not interested in using it, that's, that's interesting. That's a good idea. 
We have a question about ABR and if someone is maybe failing a newborn screening test and getting ABR done, do you see cases where maybe that improves later on? Do you tend to repeat that or if they fail that screening or fail that ABR early on, just take that as it is? Um, we do like to repeat it um, just to be sure. And then particularly if our behavioral testing isn't lining up. So we wanna make sure that we're having that cross check there to be sure that there is a profound hearing loss. Um, so we wanna have two measures of something. So there then ends up being two ABRs or an ABR and some behavioral testing. That makes sense. Um, and maybe a kind of final question here, but just curious at this point with your experience, sort of how you counsel your families, how you um, sort of lay out the different options. You know, obviously we've seen these really great outcomes with CI and um, are you using those outcomes to talk to families and say, you know, we're really seeing these improvements and, and we like to recommend CI or are you still, you know, talking through other alternative treatments as well? Um, we figure when, by the time they get to us, to the CI clinic, they have decided that they want to have hearing going to both ears. Um, they're often at the diagnostic clinic and the hearing aid clinic. That's where they're talking about options of bone conduction and cross devices. Um, so when we, they get here, you know, we tell them this is your option for hearing in two ears and being able to encourage that binaural hearing. Um, so typically that's where we go. We're talking about binaural hearing to get that implant and that the other options just aren't going to get you that binaural hearing. That's great. I think that's really, that's important, you know, and I think particularly in, in dealing with some of those issues that we really see driving patients to the clinic with auditory fatigue and, um, you know, just that spatial hearing perception and everything, um, you know, talking about that is really important. All right. Well, I do want to let everybody know that this presentation will be recorded and available. So we won't be uh, distributing slides, but we will be, um, you know, you will have access to that recording in the future if you are interested. And I did want to share here that we do have another Experts Online session that is coming up on March 9th. So we'll have Dr. Oliver Adunka and Kevin Bukovic joining us for that one to talk about bone bridge, talk a little bit about the future of implantable bone conduction hearing as well. So we hope that you are all able to join us for that presentation coming up next month. I'll just do uh, one more quick check of the chat here. Um, we did have one last question come in about uh, patients maybe with reimbursement issues. Um, you know, that's always a challenge for us here in the United States as well. Um, but I don't know if you can speak to that at all, if you've had success going through, you know, our Medicaid insurance or private insurances as well. It's always a roller coaster. Things seem to always be changing. Here in North Carolina, we're pretty lucky um, that uh, Medicare, Medicaid, excuse me, does cover cochlear implantation for single-sided deafness. It's the private insurance that we struggle with. And sometimes we find that there are certain carriers who are more likely to cover it and certain carriers that are less likely to cover it. Um, so I think that there are movements right now where there are indiv individual physicians who are going to these carriers and talking about these benefits and then it's no longer considered experimental. And that is helping some. And I think some of the professional organizations are coming out with some um, position statements that's helping as well. So I think there are movements that are getting things going in the right direction. Um, but it is always, a, it, it's, it's routinely a struggle and that we have to um, go to bat for our patients. For sure. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. I hope that's something that we continue, continue to see change, you know, move that needle forward as we continue to get more and more data supporting cochlear implants in this population, really both adults and children. Of course, it's a struggle across the age range, but we'll continue to, to try and see that move forward. So, all right. Well, I think that is it for today. Thank you again so much, uh, Dr. Park, for your time today. And thank you all for joining us. We hope that you found this useful and this will be good information to take back to your clinic and your patients and think about how you're, you're talking with patients with unilateral hearing loss and, and what you're testing. So thanks so much.